This is episode 12 with Dave Dufour. Welcome to the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. I'm your host, Sergio Millis, and each week I'll bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover how to break in and succeed in sports and life. Thanks for spending some time with me today and let the experience begin. This episode is brought to you by Sports Business Classroom, an immersive sports business training and educational experience dedicated to preparing future sports business professionals. It is a one of a kind learning opportunity for those interested in the business of basketball and jobs in sports. Sports Business Classroom combines the best of all worlds into a single package. Great academics, hands-on experience, immersion in the Las Vegas Summer League, and interaction with some of the best minds working in and around the NBA. For more information about Sports Business Classroom, go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. This episode is also brought to you by Hall Pass Media, a full-service marketing agency that specializes in brand consulting, event management, digital marketing, and creative design. For more information on Hall Pass Media, go to hallpassnetwork.com. Today's guest is Dave Dufour, podcast host and NBA writer at The Athletic. He is also the scouting, video, and analytics lead for Sports Business Classroom. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really excited for you to listen to today's episode as Dave is not only super entertaining and knowledgeable, he is also a very mindful and deliberate person from whom everybody can learn from. In this episode, we discuss his career as a professional wrestler, what it takes to cover the NBA professionally, and how disconnecting from the world regularly has been one of his keys to success. I had an awesome time doing this interview and really learned a lot from Dave, and I'm sure you will too. Without further ado, I give you Mr. Dave Dufour. So Dave, welcome to the show. I'm Really excited to be here. It's great to have you here. Yeah, I was just out in in the offices uh, a couple weeks ago and and didn't get to see you while I was out there. Yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm sorry I missed you. It was uh, where was I? You know what? I just didn't make it down for that occasion. That was it. I was hang, hanging <laughs> yeah. out with family, but so many different places we could start this interview here. But I, I figured we'd start with this. I heard from somebody that at one point in your life, you were a pro wrestler. Is this true? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait, did you hear this from Larry Coon? I, I, I did hear it from Larry. Coon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I used to be a professional wrestler. It just seemed like a fun thing to do at the time. And uh, me and me and some buddies um, had our own little professional wrestling show. Okay. And uh, we, we, we were more like an indie band than anything. Um, the show was, uh, you know, it's weird to say this about something that you made, but it was avant-garde. It was very like artsy. Like we had stories and arcs and, uh, pretty high production value. This is, this is pre YouTube. This is like early two thousands when we started. (laughs) Um, but we had, you know, we, we had these, these grand designs and, you know, we had a, I don't know, we had like a Miller high life budget. And so we had to figure out how to get things done. It's how I learned to do, it's how I learned to do video editing. The first video I edited, actually, I used uh, two VHS machines. Okay. Yeah. And two like 13 inch TVs. Um, I learned how to, you know, uh, use Photoshop and make flyers and how to light events and how to set up sound systems and you know, how to book venues and how to book bands and how to deal with these people and how to cater for, you know, 20 people and all this weird stuff that had nothing to do with actually wrestling, which, you know, I also learned how to do. Now, did you, when did, when did you gain an interest in wrestling? I mean, I grew up, I'm I'm from the South and I, I grew up, you know, in Hulk Hogan's heyday, right? So, uh, professional wrestling was on every single weekend in my house. I watched a lot of it. Okay. Um, You know, Ric Flair, one of the greatest performers in the history of, you know, performance, period, wrestling or not. And, you know, they used to come to right to my back door all the time. So, um, yeah, so I loved wrestling as a kid, Um, was an athlete, you know, my whole life. And then as an adult, just, you know, worked out a lot and and just happened to run into some guys that had a wrestling thing. And next thing you knew, I was jumping off of, you know, tight, <laughs> tight ropes, and, uh, you know, wearing, wearing tight pants. So did you wrestle in high school? 
No, I was a basketball player. You're a basketball so, player. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, they're both at the same time. So you couldn't do both. And I don't know how physically you could possibly do both with all the weight cutting right. from wrestling. But totally yeah, no, different was, body styles, right? Oh, yeah. Completely different. I'm built more like a wrestler. You are. Right? I mean, I'm 5'9". Like, someone should have taken me aside and said, you know, you're a really good athlete. You should probably play any other sport but basketball. But people aren't, people aren't honest enough, I think, with kids. They just want you to... Yeah, just go have fun. And I, I was a, I was a decent basketball player. Everybody's got to get a trophy, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, it's I don't know. I, I think that um, I, I'm kind of glad that no one said, "Hey, you've got a better chance of a scholarship if you did this." I mean, I just did everything. I ran track. I played football. I played baseball. You know, it was never, you know, the specialization that we've gotten to now. I'm, I'm kind of glad that I wasn't a part of that. But yeah, did not wrestle. Um, but you know. So you High played, school you wrestling played and professional wrestling is totally different. <laughs> yeah, no question. Yeah. So, so you played hoops. You said you grew up in the South. Where exactly did you grow up? I'm from Virginia. Gotcha. So I grew up in Richmond, yeah. Okay. And uh, just to put a bow on the wrestling thing, what was your wrestling name? I was That Guy Dave. That Guy Dave. I love it. And is yeah. there a video of this anywhere? It, it exists. I'm, I'm not going to point anyone to it, but it exists. It is out there. Okay. People have seen it. People is okay. Awesome. Well, we're going to see, uh, <laughs> yeah. we're going to see if we can get that out of you at some point. Well, the thing is, so we, what it, what it was, we were all just creative guys who loved wrestling. We wanted to make movies and this was sort of our way to do it. Like we were just doing plays essentially. It was live performance and, and we would put on these giant shows and they were very elaborate. It was fun. It was, it was a lot of fun. And again, I picked up skills doing this. I mean, because it was a small business. I picked up so many skills doing that that I've applied to every single thing I've done throughout my life. I mean, part of the reason why I was able to just start podcasting one day and be decent at it was because I was already used to speaking in public. Right. No question. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Where, yeah. you know, the things that you're doing as a kid or in college or whatever it might be, you think that, you know, all these skills you're get, you're 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 getting are going to end up being useless, but they end up being the most important things you do. Yeah, 100%. And and, and learning to be a Swiss army knife, you know? I mean, now like it used to be the specialization was the rage. Now you've got this book Range out there where people are finally learning that, oh, wow, having a diverse skill set is actually important if you want to, you know, succeed and be happy because my diverse skill set allows me to do, you know, I, I get to follow my passions a little bit more because I can do so many different things. And it all started, I mean, it probably started when I was a kid, but as an adult, I've really developed like real world weird skills doing this wrestling show. I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. One day, one day those videos are going to surface. That's, that's my <laughs> promise to the audience. I, yeah. Maybe well, 20 I, years from now, but, <laughs> but one day they're going to surface. We'll we'll do an SBC session on it uh, at Summer League. Uh, I'll, I'll pull them out. There you go. SBC after dark. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so you grew up in Virginia. Where'd you go to yes. college? I went to VCU. Okay. Virginia Commonwealth. Yeah. Uh, before it was a basketball powerhouse. And what did you decide to study while you were there? Uh, so I was a history major. And um, interesting. Yeah. Well, I always loved history, and, and I assumed, you know, that I would uh, either you know, get a PhD and be a professor mm -hmm. or go to law school, you know, one of those things that everybody always thinks about. And, um, yeah, that was not, uh, <laughs> that's not what I wound up doing. So, and I, so I never finished my history degree. Okay. I, I got into this thing where I just said, you know what, I'm here, I'm paying all this money and I'm taking these classes that I don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. Let me pivot and just start learning about stuff that I want to learn about. So I took photography, videography, uh, studied Russian because I really loved Russian history and, and Russian literature. And there's stuff that doesn't necessarily translate well. And I was like, well, you know, this is like a very niche thing to do for, for something that you just like. Um, cause I wasn't trying to teach Russian history. Uh, so I just did stuff like that. You know, I, I, I took things that interest me rather than following the a degree path and uh, much to the chagrin of my advisor. She was not happy with that. Right. I mean, how many years did you go to school? Uh, Cause you could go for a long time. Doing yeah. Courses like that. Right. So yeah, I have like, I have like four and a half years worth of credits. Okay. 
whatever that is I, I, as a full-time student, uh, but no degree. Is, you know is it a awful investment it, like on paper, but a fantastic investment for my life? Right. No question. I mean, you figured out what you did and didn't want to do, right? Which is yeah. such a huge part of just being successful. It really Yeah, is. well, and I was ahead of where a lot of people are getting in realizing that that a conventional four-year college degree for stuff, you know, like humanities and stuff like that, it just doesn't really make much sense. It doesn't the the payoff isn't there financially. And you don't acquire the skills that it takes to actually like survive in in adult life. And so, you know, it, it's great. Like if you you want to get a, a painting degree, my, my buddy has a master in fine arts painting. And he works for actually funny, he works in wrestling, he works for the WWE. Awesome. As a talent <laughs> development guy, right? Like, so, you know, what did he learn in, in that master's program about painting that applies to that? Nothing. Right. So yeah, I, I wasted a lot of money. Um, but it was at least wasted doing stuff I wanted to do. You wasted a lot of money finding yourself. Yeah, yeah, to a degree. Yeah. So at what point did you decide that you wanted to work in sports and that that was going to be your passion? Man. Um, okay. So I was, uh, I was living in South Korea. Okay. Um, how, how, well, let, let's back up here. Yeah. Right. How, how did you go from Virginia to yeah. South Korea? So my wife is in the air force. She's okay. a, she's a dentist in the air force. So a lot of these, a lot of these moves that I make in life are just following her around okay, and, and figuring things out. And so, um, we moved to South Korea and I got a job teaching at the high school on the air force base. Wow. Yeah. And, um, they were looking for a JV girls volleyball coach. And I was like, sure, I'll do it. I know volleyball, you know, I can do this. And, uh, did pretty well. I really enjoyed it, the coaching part. And I was, and I said to myself, you know, I, I really would love to coach basketball. And so I started work, training kids in the gym on the base to help them make the the team, uh, the high school team. They already had a coach uh, at the high school and, and I wasn't necessarily interested in being an assistant, which is in hindsight, like just ridiculous on my part. I definitely should have been an assistant, but I didn't do it. Uh, was training kids, you know, working, doing skill work, things like that, helping them get prepared to actually play in high school. And then when we moved from South, uh, South Korea to Germany, I found a local club, which was in Aachen, about 25 minutes from my house. And uh, I trained a couple of their guys, conned them into giving me one of their lower level teams. Okay. Uh, a position I was in no way qualified for and uh, had a lot of success with uh, with the stuff that I brought in and um, earned a promotion every year I was the coach, uh, won a league title. It's pretty good. That's awesome. So, that's, so let's, let's get into that. I want to yeah. hear about how you conned them, you know, because because so much yeah. of success and of life is, you know, you got to take a leap and you got to act as if sometimes, right? Right. And it sounds like that's yeah. what you did, but walk us through exactly how you conned them into giving you a, a job as a head coach. So I, I am like, you know, I can fake it till I make it right. Mm -hmm. Pretty much anything. Um, and, and the thing is like from a basketball X and O's acumen standpoint, uh, I felt pretty good about where I was at. I got better as I was there. Um, but from the skill part, the skill development part, I'd already been doing it for a year. Obviously I've played my entire life. So that was where I was really shining um, when I when I was training the players. They watched me interacting with the players, had a good rapport. And I think that when I say conned, I, I think that, you know, I convinced them. Sure. Right. Um, but there was a, a good foundation for, you know, someone that looked like they knew what they were doing. Um, they actually wanted me to play for them. Wow. And player and coach. I, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's what I wound up doing. Um, but they wanted me to play for one of their higher division teams. And I didn't want to do that because I wanted to coach. And so I said, I will be a player coach on, on this lower level team. And then you can call me up if you need. And I just was always injured. So it was, it worked out. Um, and, and so I used myself as a development guy for the young players on our team. 
And I would, you know, when, if we had a nice lead, I'd go out with a few of the young guys on, and play in the game and, and use myself to, to make them better. <laughs> so I was literally doing player development in games on the court with like 18, 19 year old kids. I love that. Love that. Yeah. So it was, it was an interesting like experience. Uh, by the end of it, I had taken over player development for the whole club and was kind of just saying, you know, these are the things you really need to focus on, especially with the, the, the kids. Um, because in Europe, you know, they didn't do a lot of individual dribbling work and things like that. So, and you would see that, um, as they got up, you know, where everybody was a little bit more athletic, like mm -hmm. in high school age and, uh, that lack of ball handling, I, I noticed, you know, it was like, wow, this is very rudimentary, right? They could all pass, which is great. You had a little bit of ball handling and all of a sudden now you've got something. And that, that was like the biggest change I made, which seems so insignificant, but the results were, were pretty huge. And so you were there for how long? I was there. I was there for, I was in Germany for four years. Wow. Okay. Do you speak yeah. German? Uh, only enough to, you know, eat a lot and order beer. Enough to get by. The, yeah, import, the important mean, things. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I, I travel a lot and my big thing is I always need to know, please, thank you. You know, the, the general courtesy stuff. But when I was living in Germany, my German was fine. I got I got through most days with no problem. What did you how did you learn German? Just on the fly. I used a I had Duolingo. I think I had Rosetta Stone then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and then we switched to Duolingo when that came out because it was pretty good. So you, do you speak a little bit of Korean as well? Uh no. <laughs> no. no. Okay. Not at all. Okay. So no Korean, a no. little only, bit of German, little yeah. English. No, a tiny bit of English. A uh, tiny bit of Russian because, you know, if you don't use that, you lose it. Um, but, yeah, please and thank you in like 20 languages. That's that's the important one. There you go. That's impressive. Yeah. That's more than what most people could say. So good for you. Well, we always, I always do the refresher before I go somewhere, too. Um, I'm getting ready to, you know, we were talking, I'm getting ready to take a trip. And I need to make sure that I'm on my P's and Q's when I show up because uh, it it that's a, that kind of stuff goes a long way. It really you know, does. When you're talking to people and everybody speaks English, but I never want to make the assumption. So it's a lot of, you know, when I, when I've run into people that didn't speak English, like in that, which has happened a lot because I take my motorcycle out into weird places and, um, you, you get really good at body language and hand signals mm -hmm. that those come in handy. I, they should teach a college <laughs> course on that, right? Like, yeah. Give me give me the, the body language and hand signal class. There you go. Do you, do you have how many how many countries have you been to? Do you know? 50? 50. Wow. Something like that? Yeah. I I haven't counted. Okay, but, but I you think know it's, it's around there. Somewhere between 45 and 50. Man. I've yeah. been to about 16 at this point, which is pretty good by most people's standards, but yeah. you just make me look bad. Well, but again, so living in Europe right? Made it really easy. And, and you can get everywhere. I mean, that's true. It takes it takes about 12 hours to drive on I-10 across Texas, the entire state. If I drove 12 hours from my house in Germany, I was only one kilometer from the Dutch border. I was 10 minutes from Belgium. Right. You know, I was 45 minutes from France. I was an hour from Luxembourg. So if I drove 12 hours, I could hit 10 countries, depending on which direction I was going. So, yeah. you know, I kind of, I kind of spammed the country count meter quite a bit. Hey, you, but, you're there. You might as well. All right. So that, that's yeah. what your weekend trips look like, right? We're going to go to, oh, uh, we're, we're going to this country or that. And, yeah. and, and we'll get into, um, you know, big believer in traveling and seeing the world, which we'll get into a little bit later here. But so when did you get back to the U S uh, about five years ago, um, I think it was uh 20 yeah it was 2015 summer of 2015 we moved to Arizona um I got a job coaching at a small high school took over a girls team that hadn't won a game for three years wow that was yeah I didn't have basketball players at this school mm -hmm. um and I, only, I got the job because someone in my neighborhood I guess their kids went there and they were about to start the season and they didn't have a girls coach and so I was like yeah I'll take it you know, I, I didn't have anything going on at the time. No basketball stuff. I was like, yeah, I'll take it. I'll be happy to. Um, and it was interesting. You want to talk about uh, an incredibly humbling experience. It was uh, coaching high school basketball. 
Because you're not as so much a coach as you are like a therapist. <laughs> right. I can imagine. Yeah. How'd you guys do that first season? Uh, they won three games. Okay. Yeah. So again, there, there are ways, like if you know the game, you can go to, you know, low level high school basketball and you can, you can be a successful coach just by applying stuff that works like in the NBA mm -hmm. or in Europe to high school. And so we lacked talent, so we needed high variance. So we started shooting a lot of threes. It's essentially all, all we did was play defense and shoot threes. And we were shooting in a 32 minute game. We were shooting like 35 to 40 threes a game. Love it. Yeah. And we were shooting like we were shooting like 20 percent from three. <laughs> a lot of bricks. Uh, but, you know, they won three games. We were competitive in, in a few more. And, you know, I, I stick I stuck with them for the whole time I was in Arizona and you know, we, I think we were nine and eight my last season there. So, you know, okay. we saw a lot of growth. Turned the program around. Yeah, it was fun. It was a good time. And then uh, I see that you worked at the Sean Miller basketball camp in 2016. How'd you get involved with that? So, I, you know, I just sent an email to the, to the staff. Um, it was right before I was going to do SBC. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what, let me go. Maybe I'll, I'll meet Sean Miller. Didn't you know, because the staff just runs that, but I did meet the staff and, and hung out and, you know, I was, uh, let's see, I don't know. I was like 30 it was four years ago. I was like 35. So most of the people working the camp are college kids, maybe fresh out of college. So that was interesting. Yeah. Um, and it was the, it was the youngest age group I had worked with. This was like middle school kids. I'd only, I'd only, you know, coach high school or adults at that point. Um, so that was interesting. Um, but it was, you know, it was a neat experience. I don't, I don't, didn't feel the need to do it again ever. Um, you know, you, you really like, it's like summer camp, you're babysitting quite a bit. Um, but it was, uh, I did pick up a couple of things coaching wise that I, that I stole. I really liked the way they did their station work. Um, okay. So I stole that. Yeah. But yeah, I did that basketball camp because I, I was, about to go to Vegas and do SBC. Hmm. And I thought, why not get a head start on, you know, a whole networking thing by meeting this college staff. So, right. Get, get warmed up. Yeah. So SBC, let's talk a little bit about that. So you went, you attended in 2016, right? For those of you who yep. are not familiar with what SBC is, it's sports business classroom. What made you decide to apply? Uh, well, so there was sports business classroom and then there was the other event yeah, uh, yeah. that that happens uh, in Vegas. And uh, the people attached, my, my thing was I wanted to work in the NBA or, or at least I thought I wanted to work in the NBA. And the people attached to sports business classroom uh, were all people that were prominent well-known and it's like oh yeah and you're literally in the building mm -hmm. um so for my purposes i was like okay perfect this is the this is the right one for me and you know like <laughs> learning the cba and salary cap from mr cba and salary cap never hurts right no question what were uh what were some of your fondest memories of that uh, of sbc um well i you know if you have any yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit, um, but I, it was work. So yeah. the way I approached it, you know, it was I'm I'm going to work for a week. And so I did enjoy it while I was in it. Do I have like one particular moment? It, I mean, Nate Duncan taking me aside and, and kind of saying, you should start a podcast <laughs> might be the one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I made f so many good friends there, like uh, Amit you know, who works with us still. Sure. Um, obviously Larry and, and Eric Pincus and, and Nate, you know, I like got to know these people because of how intimate that whole week is. I, I think that was my favorite part was just meeting new people who kind of shared this, this basketball passion. Um, that was, that was for sure my favorite part of the entire event. Yeah. And I like what you said about how, you know, you showed up basically SPC is a, you know, let's say for for lack of a better way to put it, like a seven day conference, right? Yeah. Where you you can go and you can hang out, 
or you can do what you did and work right and and really take full advantage of all the opportunities there and it sounds like that's what you decided to do and if i'm not mistaken that was a a huge catalyst for where you're at at this point absolutely absolutely i I would not i had not thought about doing any media stuff until then until until nate duncan told you you should think about doing a podcast Yep. Do you know what I'm, made him, what prompted him to, to, to say that? Um, you know, I just imagine the way I present myself, just that, you know, I, I have no issue, you know, speaking in public and obviously know the sport. I don't know if Nate still feels this way. He might think it's a huge mistake to have gotten <laughs> me to start a podcast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know why. I, I just assume it's those things. But yeah, I hadn't thought about doing anything like that. Um, I thought about starting a podcast, but I was going to start a history podcast, not a basketball podcast. It just hadn't occurred to me to to do that. Because again, my goal wasn't to work in media. I, you know, I'm a coach. Right. My thought was, you know, I, you know, I can get on with a coaching staff or, you know, maybe I can get it, you know, a scout job or something like that. Not a video job because that is not, I do not want to hang out in the video room, uh, but something, something to that degree. And, and so like, that was my whole focus the entire time I was there until Nate just kind of casually was like, you know, you should think about starting a podcast. There you go. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. And so, you know, you finished SBC. What, what did you do next? Um, so I, I actually, I went and saw you guys uh, at Adidas Nations. Yep. And. Then the Olympics were right after that. And I did my first podcast in August of 2016 during the Olympics. And for those that don't know the history, what was the name of the podcast? It was, it was on the NBA with Dave DeFore. And was it a solo, a solo podcast or talk a little bit about the format? And- so I did, I did a little bit of both. I would do them alone occasionally. Uh, Usually I'd have, you know, another NBA media person on and, you know, I used to think that guests were important, um, that going out and like getting a big name guest was like the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Although I refused to use uh, Nate, Larry or Eric Pincus for that whole first year. Why is that? I refused. Just out of pride? Just out of pride. Okay. Just I out of pride. I was like, I am not going to lean on the sports business classroom, direct connection for guests for the podcast. I I don't know why it it was silly. It was a bad idea. I I should have just done it. Larry Kuhn should have been the first guest. Um, But I just, you know, I used to think, okay, I got to get these guests, got to get these guests. And then I realized by the end of that first year, all the best performing episodes were the ones where I was talking to like my favorite people to talk to about basketball. It was, it was talking to Mo DeKeel. It was, you know, I was talking to uh, my buddy, James Hollis. It was, you know, stuff like that. So the guys that I enjoy or, or gals that I enjoyed talking to mm-hmm. always got the best results. And so I went away from trying to get guests and just said, you know what, I'm going to talk basketball with people that I want to talk basketball with. And so it, it would go, you know, I do three or four episodes a week, depends on time of the year. And I would do at least two with a guest and one solo. And the solo ones were often, you know, Q&A. Mm-hmm. So I'd take questions. Um, I started doing them live. I would, I would broadcast them on Periscope or Twitch and take questions live, which has now turned into my weekly Q&A on The Athletic that I do, which is, you know, incre- I can't believe I can keep up at this point. Like there's so many people pop on there. But I, I, I stand by... The fact that pe- I'm just known for doing these Q and A's, and I've just always done them, and I think it's kind of carried over into this. But uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting it was an interesting process. I learned again, picked up more skills, you know, audio editing, uh, built a studio, you know, all of these things that I just had never thought to do before. Yep. Um, how social media which is why now we, we talk so much about it at SBC because it's so important. Nobody knows you're doing anything if it's not on social media. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> which much to my chagrin. Um, so, you know, I, I, again, picked up more skills, picked up more skills. And then when I came back to Summer League the following summer, people knew who I was. So how many episodes did you do? You said you did three or four a week. Oh, yeah. 
What was the um, what was the turning point for the pod? Like, did you have an episode that really just kind of put you on the map, or you know, that really blew up? And you know, what was that? If so, no, you're digging a hole. That's the thing about a podcast. If you're not famous, it you're you're out there digging holes, mm -hmm. and it's like you know, you, I can only do a shovel full at a time. Right. If I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, I get a good guest, and for at least that episode, I've got two shovels going. And, and it, it really is, you're just sitting there digging until one day you're like standing in a swimming pool. And that's kind of how it was. It was just being consistent, uh, just like SBC. And I have this thing, like, like I'm, I'm very on top of my work. I'm not a procrastinator. Mm -hmm. My schedule, like I have a schedule, it's going to happen at this time. You know, obviously when you're dealing with other people, you know, things happen, but for the most part, I'm going to record at this time every day or every other day. I'm going to put the show out at this time. I'm going to have all this stuff ready. Boom, boom, boom. And I just did that for, you know, a year. Well, I guess I did my podcast for two years, but um, that whole first year of trying to grow. And I, by the way, <laughs> that first year, my podcast went from zero listens. You know, first episode, I think I got like 10 listens to uh, like, if I just did August to August, the on August 1st, the following year, I think I was at a thousand. So per it's episode. not like, it's not like it blew up. Yeah. A thousand per episode. So it's not like it blew up. I mean, a thousand is nothing. Like, I mean, Bill Simmons probably does, you know, 5 million an episode. And that's not after to, doing three or four episodes per week, right? Yeah. 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 Like you said, you're digging holes, which you right. know what? Good for you though, for sticking with it. Cause it's not, it's not, especially these days, right, where you can very clearly see what the analytics are, how many people are listening, right? Like mm -hmm. to, to, to stick with it, you know, is it's, hey, I, I know you, so I, I know that's something yeah. that you would do. But at yeah. the same time, you know, for all those, for all of you who are listening, right, again, three to four episodes per week for a year and at its peak was getting a thousand listens per episode, right? Which isn't enough to even get a sponsorship. Right. And so, you know, and then I just kept going, right? I just kept plugging, kept yep. plugging away, kept plugging away. And then at its peak, before I, before I left my podcast to go join uh, Count the Dings and then The Athletic, you know, I was up to like four to 5,000 an episode, which is, is pretty good. Um, that's more than something like 98% of all podcasts that exist. So what was the key to getting, getting your listenership up? It it literally is just consistency, quality, of course, you mm -hmm. know, because there's, you know, the, the market is so flooded with podcasts. I mean, everyone has a podcast, literally. And I'm not a former player, I'm not a former coach. Uh, I'm not an Instagram model. I'm not, you know, a, a YouTuber. I'm not, I was, you know, none of these things that would give you like a head start. So I just had to be better at analysis, better at production. Uh, you know, super on time, on schedule, uh, more engaged with my fans. I mean, you know, and this is something I picked up from Nate because Nate is fantastic about this. Like Nate, his engagement is high because Nate engages with people. Mm -hmm. And so that was my thing is like, I may not be able to, I may not be able to, you know, have a podcast that does a million downloads, but I can answer every single question I get on Twitter. I can respond to every single person that says something to me on Twitter. Um, you know, and, and so I, again, winning the little battles that I could, you know, added up to more and more listens. And I mean, you know, again, three to 4,000 listens, uh, an episode is really good, but still it's not like, you're not making money on that, you know? Um, so I kind of lucked out that I was just good at it and someone else hired me. Right. No question. So I, before we move on, I want to touch on a couple of things. One you know, again, you alluded to, you know, digging small holes, right? I mean, yeah, digging small holes, sticking with it, you know, and, and just getting small wins, right? That's so much about, you know, I, at least from where I stand, what life is all about, right? It's like everybody yeah. thinks, you know, overnight success or whatever it might be. I mean, that rarely exists, right? It's, no such thing. There's no such thing. And by, behind every quote unquote overnight success there's somebody that's been digging holes and there's somebody who's been improving little by little each and every single day. Right. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with the fact that, you know, 
even though you weren't breaking the internet, you had your schedule every day and you were committed to executing and you were committed to engaging. Right. And again, I just want, I just want to uh, make sure that the audience really takes that in, right. That you were that dedicated to your craft and that's what led you to where you are today. Well, look at Stephen King. Stephen King writes what? 30 pages a day. Right. All right. It worked out well for him. You know, I, I think that, there, like, certainly, like, I could sit around and wait to just be inspired. And I don't get me wrong, I certainly have my moments like that. Um, but at the end of the day, with stuff like this, it's about what you produce. And I just said, this is what I'm going to produce. And I mean, I'm going to come hell or high water. These podcasts are going to come out when they come out, or when they're supposed to come out every single week, and people will know, all right, I can wake up, and I'm going to I'm going to have a podcast on my player Tuesday morning, every single week, no matter what. I think that stuff is important. No question. And Jerry Seinfeld, same thing, right? He, he makes sure that every single day he writes a joke, right? He knows that they may not all be funny, but he's writing a joke every single day. And apparently he's done so for the past, you know, 40 odd years. So yeah. Want to talk about where you're at today. Um, you work for The Athletic. How Actually, let's, let's go back a little bit. How did you end up with The Athletic? So uh, I joined Count the Dings. Um, the, you know, Jade Hoy, uh, who was a producer at ESPN for a long time, left, started a, a new venture with, you know, Amino Hassan and Zach Harper and, and a bunch of other guys, Tom Haberstroh. And Tom Haberstroh took a TV job with uh, NBC Sports, regional networks. And so he couldn't continue to host Nerder She Wrote. Um, I have a good rapport with those guys, and uh, they they asked me if I'd take it over. And, and it's funny because it's not – like Tom and I are totally different as far as like our analysis goes. Um, Tom, more numbers heavy than I am, and I'm much more like basketball X and O's type heavy. Um, so it was interesting that, that even with that difference, Jade and and those guys could see, oh, okay, but this is something, this is somebody we can work with. And so I, you know, I joined them and, and and then we were acquired by the athletic, uh, to, to launch their podcast. I mean, we were the first podcasts on the athletic. Wow. And now there's 150 or something. Really? Yeah. There's a lot. (laughs) There's a lot of podcasts. Yeah. Um, but we were the first group of podcasts to, and not just NBA, but like all sports. So currently you are a part of how many podcasts? Man. Uh, okay. So I am on basketball buds, nerder. She wrote the daily ding from the Rose garden, which is a Portland trailblazers podcast. Uh, the field house files, which is an Indiana Pacers podcast. Um, 77 minutes in heaven, which is a Dallas oh, wow. Mavericks podcast. Um, and I think there's, is there one? I, and I, then I'm recurring on, on other shows. Like I pop in and out. Um, like tonight, for instance, I, I had the daily ding, but I'm also doing wizards after dark with Fred Katz. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of shows. <laughs> it's a lot of shows. And how many hours per day would you say you're recording? So per day, it, it varies. It, it obviously depends on the day. Sure. So like today, right? If we're counting this show, um, I, I counting this show, it'll be three hours today. Okay. Total. And, and what does the prep look like? Seven to nine hours, seven to nine hours worth of prep. No, seven to nine hours worth of audio for the week. Okay. Gotcha. The prep, the prep is the prep is like six every hour. Roughly. This is an easy hour. Cause I'm just talking about myself. I don't have to, you know, I'm not watching Mo Bamba film. Yeah. So talk to, a little bit the about SBC what the prep podcast. The, uh, t- <laughs> talk, talk a little yeah. bit about what the prep looks like, right? I mean, you are no longer a casual fan, right? As uh, as to be expected, considering your gig. But right. can you paint a picture for the audience, like what your day to day looks like, so that you're prepared to do all these podcasts? Uh, okay. So uh, let me just I'll walk you through my day. Please. All right, I get up at like six, get up at like six 30. Uh, you know, I've, I'm a dog guy. I've got three dogs. So, uh, you know, start getting their, their food prepped while my coffee is getting ready. 
uh, feed the dogs, drink my coffee in my office by 7.30. That's, that's always the goal. I want to be sitting at my desk or standing at my desk uh, by 7.30. Fire up Synergy, catch up on stuff that I didn't see the night before, because I try to see at least a little bit of everything. Uh, we're at the point now, mid-January, where you can kind of start stop watching certain teams, you know, like the bad, really bad teams. I just, they aren't important to the narrative of the season. Um, and so I, I watch film usually from like 7.30 till about 10. And then I had to, then I get into my Google Docs or whichever show, and I start coming up with the talking points. These are the things we want to hit. This is uh, kind of the direction we want to take the show. I try to grab any relevant stats that I might need, throw them in the Google Doc, um, or just leave the tab open if, if it's quite a bit of stuff. Uh, pull up stats, talk to the people I'm going to do the show with, do pre, pre-production, pre then record, usually 12 or 1 o'clock local time for me. Uh, finish up recording, and then most days I'm stacking, and I'm so I'm doing podcasts back to back to back. Uh, day like today, podcast came and talked to you, and then I've got tonight's games. So I have to, I'm recording the Daily Ding, which is our recap show that comes out first thing in the morning. So I will spend from about 6 p.m. local time tonight till about midnight watching games and then record for 30 minutes and do the recap. That's today. So, so you'll record tonight at what time? About 12.30, 1 a.m. Wow. Yeah. And then I'm going to do Wizards After Dark, where I talk about the Washington Wizards. That's a, that's a pretty yeah. big load. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot, but it's fun. You know, um, it, it, like mostly I just talk to people that I really like. Mm -hmm. um, so that part is fun. And, and then, you know, I'm talking about basketball and getting paid to do it, which, you know, that's, that's a dream job for a lot of people. Yeah, no question. I think it's it's also important for people to understand, you know, what it really takes to be a member of the media, right? Uh, yeah, it, I mean, because you, like you you have to you have to have such a broad knowledge base, especially in basketball, because you never know where the conversation is going to go. Even even though I might start and say, okay, I want to talk about Zion coming back, we may wind up talking about Victor Oladipo coming back. Mm -hmm. He'll be back, you know, next week and, and just as normal flow of the conversation. So, you know, I, I like to always be prepared. Yeah. And you have to be, let, let, let me ask you this, as far as prep goes, right. Did you learn kind of what it was going to take from somebody else? Or was this something that you've been experimenting with as far as like, Hey, if I do X, Y, and Z, I'll feel good about, you know, my obligations. Yeah. So it it is varied on the amount of pre-show prep I would do. I'm doing more right now than I've probably ever done, mm -hmm. but I also have a lot more pressure as far as like you know the the show needs to be really good, um, and and it 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 has to be a little less casual, uh, and you know Seth Partnow who who does my weekly show with me every week, uh, just coming back from working for a team. So I want to make sure that that he's getting started on the right foot, you know, and and really taking the guesswork out for for my co-hosts. Uh, so right now I probably do more prep than I've ever done, but this is just a culmination of, you know, this is year four of covering the league like this, and me realizing, okay, this works, this stuff doesn't work, this does work, and and the show prep and having stuff ahead of time and and pulled up is just so much better, and then everyone's operating with the same, you know, from the same spot instead of my, my co-hosts or my guests trying to guess where the show is going to go. I'm not throwing any curveballs. So yeah, this is, this is literally just trial and error. Interesting. So back to that, you said, you know, you're, you're in year four, you've kind of figured out what works, what doesn't work. What, what would you say are the keys to success in what you're doing right now? Um, it's, I mean, it's really just showing up every day. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. Um, you know, like digging small holes still <laughs> every yeah. day. And, you know, I treat, I, I try to treat this like a real job. 
you know, because I, I, no one sees it this way, even me who works it. But I still try <laughs> to treat it like one. Right. I try to say, all right, I have to I know I've got eight hours in the office today. Minimum. Yep. That's it. Right. Uh, it's cool that I work from home. Right. Like my dogs can come in, sniff my feet while I'm working. That's awesome. But I'm in the office eight hours a day. And so that has helped quite a bit. You know, the I'm going to work. I'm there for eight hours. Don't get distracted. That helps. Um, the, the tricky part comes with turning it off. So like on Friday, you know, at five or whenever I'm quitting for Friday, I actually try to quit early on Fridays, try to get up, try to be out of the office at two on Fridays. And then I take the weekend off. So then, OK, do, does that mean I leave my phone at home? Because so much of this job is social media. Does right. that mean I'm not going to watch basketball on the weekends? What, you know, what does that stuff mean? It's been way harder to set limits on, on what I'm doing versus just showing up and doing the work. Right. Well, not to mention, you know, like you, you said earlier, you have a wife, right? Right. Which, yeah. you know, I'm sure she may not appreciate you watching games from, you know, I think you said what, six till midnight. Oh yeah. I'm sure she's a big fan of that. Is she uh, a basketball fan? She's a basketball fan, but she's, she's over it. Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> she, she's done. And, and so this is another reason why I have, I've changed, I've actually changed the way that I watch games. Um, if I'm not recording our recap show, uh, the odds are I'm not watching games at night because I can just watch them the next day in the office. You know, I go see a movie, I go out to dinner, I do, you know, anything but watch basketball. Right. Well, that's part of the reason why, you know, I asked what, you know, I, I like to ask all of our guests, what are your keys to success? Right. Because at the end of the day, there's patterns there, right? Once you've, oh, yeah. once you've played the game for long enough, you should be able to figure out what's working for you and what hasn't. And yeah. it's about, you know, like we talked about earlier, digging small holes and getting incrementally better each and every day. But if you're not, doing a pod, you know, at midnight, then, you know, that's space for other stuff. Yeah. And, and I, I used to be really bad about this. I, I used to not be able to turn it off, you know, thinking like, oh man, I've got to live tweet this game and all that. And you know, none of that stuff really matters. Um, the biggest thing is showing up all the time. And I mean, just in his success in this, uh, I don't know, working in a restaurant, um, working on a boat. I don't care what it is. If you don't show up every day and say, well, I'm working while I'm here, then you're not getting anywhere. You know? And so th I think that that's something that should just apply across the board. Mm -hmm. It's just that this, this job is just tricky because of the other waters you have to navigate. Like it's so much about social media and trying to draw attention to yourself, which is, you know, kind of goes a little bit against how I feel about life in general. Right. Um, <laughs> right. And that, that was like the biggest hurdle I had to overcome was, you know, I got to, you know, put myself out there a little bit more. Not that I have an issue. Like I love interacting with people. And I mean, you, you and I have been in the same circles. Um, I'm, I like to think I'm a very gregarious person. I, I get along well with everybody, but to the internet, opening myself up to the internet has been the trickiest part about the job. I can imagine, right? Because you don't yeah. you don't want to be swayed by what the internet's trying to tell you, yet engaging is right. a part of your job, right? It just is. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, like the local newspaper guy. I think that would have been a fun job back in the day. Um, doesn't work now though. That newspaper guy's gotta be on Twitter talking mm -hmm. to people, you know, he could be based in Texas, he's talking to people in Alaska. Just how it is. No, and I like what you said about just being a pro, right? And showing up every day. And I can't yeah. stress enough. You know, that's, I, I heard something recently. I don't remember where I heard it, but it, 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 it was just about how, you know, there are people who have jobs and then there's pros. The, the difference between the two people is that pros show up each and every day and do the boring stuff, whether they like it or not. Right. Right. That is such a differentiating factor in all aspects of life. Like it, it, it's hard to overstate. How I mean, look, at, look at the NBA, look at the NBA. When a guy like we all know the guys that work hard and we all know the guys that don't. Right. And then when you have talent and guys that work hard, that's when special things happen. Right. 
exactly. And that's when you get, you know, when the guys are working hard behind the scenes and they don't put it on social media and people say, oh, where'd this guy come from? That's your overnight success. Yep, absolutely. So what, what motivates you to uh, keep digging holes? I, honestly, I don't know. Okay. That, so it's, it's such a funny, it's such a, that's such a funny question because I, people ask me a lot, like what motivates you? I don't know. Um, I just do it. I mean, the, the money helps. Sure. If I'm being honest, like the money helps. I, I don't know that I'd be doing this because I did it for free for the first two years. I don't think I'd be doing this for free anymore. Um, because it, I mean, and we talked about this a little bit before the show and I said, I wasn't going to bring it up, but I don't care. I'm good. Uh, they, like talking about basketball is not like my passion in life. Um, it's just something I do for money right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that I'll do it forever. I don't know that I'll do it next year. We'll see. Um, but like, as far as the motivation, uh, it's just the work, right? Like I'm going to do basketball no matter what. Um, I might as well do this and get paid to do it. I think that's where it's at, which I, I'm sure is like extremely inspiring <laughs> to everyone <laughs> listening. <laughs> um, but you know, that's where it is, right? Like, my my passion is coaching and coaching is just not available to me to me right now, like for, right. for various reasons. And so this is just what I'm doing, you know, until I get back to coaching. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, I've read a couple of really cool things that you've you've said um, or that have been written about you in an article. One of them was um, and I quote, first and foremost, I'm going to have a good time. Life is short. I try not to take myself too seriously. Well, yeah. Talk a little bit about that, if you can, about just how you've uh, how you've managed to 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 keep that mindset. Um, you know, I, I think that um, I I've had bouts of taking myself too seriously, um, and I, it always has made me miserable. You know, I like I like to have a good time. I like to enjoy myself. I like to enjoy life. I like you know my relatively stress free life, which part of that is. I don't care what other people think about me. That's number one. Um, I'm very secure in who I am. So, you know, what, what do I care about other people's opinions of me? Uh, it, you know, if they're negative, you know, if they're warranted negative opinions, like let's have a conversation, you know, um, like I'm open to criticism, but I just don't necessarily uh, let it dictate my life. Uh, but, but not taking myself too seriously is, is actually one of the only reasons I could do this job because I, I have to be open to the idea that I'm not right about everything, which I, is very hard for for people in, in basketball media. I've found. Um, I can imagine. But the truth is, I'm not. I don't know everything. I'm not. I'm not. You know, like my my brain is a normal human brain. I've not been doing the media stuff that long, so sometimes I'm right and I just present it the wrong way, and then I have to go about explaining it in a way that makes people understand that. What I meant was this. So I've gotten, I've gotten better because of some of this stuff. But I think if you take yourself too seriously, you, you tend to entrench in these ideas instead of trying to figure out, A, why you're wrong, or B, try to re-explain your point in a way that is clearer. Um, you know, because it's easy to just fire something out there and then just ignore, you know, when people, when people don't understand. It's very easy to just ignore it. Um, but I think part of not taking myself too seriously is my ability to, uh, to take in that information and then say, okay, well, no, no, this is what I actually was trying to say. Um, but yeah, like life is too short when you consider, you know, the human lifespan, let's say 80, 85 years and the earth has been around for, you know, what, 7 billion or something. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time without you on the planet yeah. in both directions. Right. So, uh, why waste it being miserable or bummed out or not laughing? You know, like I, I just, I don't know that life, life can be so much fun, so much more fun than a lot of people allow it to be. So I try to make it as fun as I can. I absolutely love that. Now you mentioned that you've had some bouts where you were taking life too seriously and your job too seriously. Like, what does that look like? Um, you, you know what it is? It's that this is ego thing. It's actually, you know, I bring up the, uh, the Vegas summer league 
motto a lot. Yep. Let's hear your it. Ego, your ego is not your amigo. That's right. Right. And um, it, it's because there's no way to say this. All right. So I'm a subject matter expert on the sport of basketball. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's, that's like plain and simple language. Right. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that I know everything. Right. But it means that, you know, I have this knowledge base. And so there are times where people like will get into arguments, which is fine, right? And and 90% of the time, totally fine. But there's this 10% of the time where I just have, you know, I've caught myself feeling like, well, who is this person to question me? I do <laughs> not like that. I don't like when I feel that way. So like I always have to try to take a step back and and adjust because, you know, I like to be an open minded person and that's not that's not how you have you you never get anywhere. You never get any better. Uh not only like as an analyst, but as a person. You can't get any better if you just assume that nobody can offer anything to you. And so that's what I mean by taking myself too seriously. I, I can learn from everybody. Hell, I've learned from people that don't even really know the sport. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean hey. I sat down with a friend and we were watching Steph Curry play uh in fifteen sixteen. So like the peak of Steph Curry. And, uh, and it, he didn't, he didn't necessarily teach me anything, but he said this thing in a way that was just such perfect plain English. And he, this is not a basketball fan, never had seen Steph Curry play. And he just said, wow, it seems like that Steph Curry guy shoots a lot of threes. How come everybody doesn't do that? <laughs> right? Right. And the easy thing to, for me to say would, well, you know, actually blah, blah, blah. But the truth is him distilling it that way was perfect right so right no yeah. it's absolutely I try to be so open much. to that kind of stuff yeah i think again going back to what's important in life you know i'm i'm still trying to figure it out myself but i do know that being open to learning and growing is certainly one of the keys to success yeah i, I think that um it's hard to be inquisitive if you think you know everything if you if you take yourself too seriously and hold yourself in too high regard. It's, it's hard to learn new things, get yourself into interesting situations, which I always just seem to do, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm naturally inquisitive. And so for the most part, I, I, I steer clear of taking myself too seriously, but occasionally it does happen. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I am human. Yeah. Yeah. For okay. the most part. Apparent, <laughs> apparently. So let's, let's talk about that. Do you have any, uh, as far as being inquisitive and all that good stuff, do you have any favorite books? Pod, well, you said you don't listen to podcasts anymore. I but. don't listen to podcasts anymore. Uh, although, I, you know, hardcore history, uh -huh. if, if you don't listen to it, um, if you're a history fan, uh, I think that that's probably the best podcast that's ever existed. Wow. Never listened to it. Oh, man. I'll check you it out. Are, oh, yeah. You're missing out. It, okay. Um, yeah, Dan Carlin, he, he essentially writes a book. He makes an audio book his, as a history podcast. So he writes a new book for every show, essentially. Wow. It's really impressive. Okay. Um, I'll check it out. I'll, yeah. I'll check it out. What about, do you have any favorite books or books that um, have, uh, you know, that you've read that maybe have changed your thinking, shaped the way you look at life or? So I don't read nonfiction for the most part. Um, I mean, maybe I'll read a biography here and there, but I haven't read in a biography in a long time. Um, so I'm not like a nonfiction guy. Uh, I read a lot of Hemingway. I have read a lot of Hemingway in my life and, and, you know, I'll pick up Hemingway when I need to, um, the sand County almanac is, an, is another good book. I really am I'm a big fan of like the outdoors. And so, um, there's a whole like list of guys like Jim Harrison, who wrote a lot about, you know, Montana, Wyoming and all that stuff. And I really like that. Um, but yeah, read a lot of comic books, actually. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, because when I want to turn my brain off, that's when I'll, you know, grab a comic book. Okay. And great. Any, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, talk about that a little bit. What do you, what do you, what do you like to read? Uh, it varies. I mean, I, I was a Marvel kid growing up, so I, I still read Marvel. Um, you know, I, I there's a uh, why the last man is a very good graphic novel that you can pick up. Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic 
scenario. I don't want to spoil it for anybody listening, but it's very good. I'm assuming eventually they'll make a TV show out of it. Um, you know, Watchmen. Yeah. Which I'm sure you've you've read. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, that one's kind of in the zeitgeist. But yeah, comic books are good, man, for for being able to turn your brain off. It's so important. I mean, you mentioned being an outdoorsman and turning your brain off. Like, do, do you make a concerted effort every week to, you know, turn your brain off, get outdoors? And if so, yeah. you know, what, what does I that try. look like? So it, in uh, we now live in San Antonio. So the outdoors scenario, like situation is not as good as it was when I was in Southern Arizona, which is just one of the most beautiful parts of America. Um, but I have a, a big dog that loves to hike. So, you know, we just run to like a local park that has got like some outdoorsy type features. We wander through the woods a little bit. Um, but I, you know, and you and I have talked about this, I think, but I camp a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, and I like to take road trips where I camp. And so I try to do that whenever possible with this job, it gets tougher. So I try to spend August, September and October until the season starts doing that as much as possible. So like last September, I spent 10 days, you know, going through, uh, Northern Arizona, Utah and Colorado. I was going to a buddy's wedding. And so I was in my van again, you know, hiking and camping and meeting people and drinking bourbon, you know, visiting little tiny mountain towns that I didn't know existed and yeah. stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. Um, got to, got to spend a lot of time in the woods, just alone, climbing mountains, got a little altitude sickness on, on a hike, which was weird and interesting. <laughs> um, you know, felt like, uh, felt like garbage until I got down the mountain, but it was still like a good experience and it was beautiful up there. But so 10 uh, days yeah. alone, huh? I mean, or, oh, man, or, it's great. or, or, ten, or now did you ten start with the... strangers? Right. Right. But yeah. you know, you left, you, you left your home alone knowing yep. that it's just time for adventure. Yeah. Yep. And, wow. uh, I like to do that. So this summer I'm, I'm considering taking a trip to Alaska. Okay. Um, I'd bring the dogs on that trip though. Can't, can't go to Alaska without an adventure dog. And when you're hiking, are you listening to anything or is it just you and your thoughts or what's the scenario just, there? Just me and my thoughts, uh, squirrels, birds. Yeah, that's it. I, I just, you know, again, like I, I don't listen to podcasts anymore. Yeah. Um, I enjoy silence and especially when I'm, when I'm out in nature, you know, the, I mean, there's a reason why those sounds are always on, you know, the meditation apps or sleep apps or anything like that. So it's a nice way to just shut things off. I, as a matter of fact, my phone uh, is usually on airplane mode when I'm hiking um, and in my in my backpack. So I can avoid that thing where you're constantly pulling your phone out and checking it. Right. Um, you know, maybe I'll pull it out to take photos or something like that. But it's yeah, a good hack. yeah, yeah. Out of sight, out of mind. And, and, you know, I've even gotten to the point now where on the weekends, just normal weekends, I leave my phone at home. And I charge my phone in my office instead of, you know, next to my bed or whatever. Um, cause I didn't like that. I would wake up in the morning and check social media. Right. So this is, this is my attempt to like compartmentalize the job and, uh, yeah, getting out and hiking and, and camping is a huge part of that for me. I wish I could do it more during the season. It's just tough because if you don't have good internet, you're not, you're not able to pull up league pass. What do you think or explain to the audience what it does for you when you make time away from your phone to go camping, to just be alone with your thoughts and in nature? Explain to me, like, you know, obviously you do it for fun. You do it for adventure and all that good stuff. But, you know, what are the benefits you get out of it besides that? Oh, well, I mean, this is like those are my best brainstorming sessions. I just have time to think and you know, you never know what's going to pop up. You know, I, I take these big motorcycle trips and it's just me in a helmet and the road and you just think. And, you know, my wife is actually a big proponent of me taking these trips because she says I always come back inspired and with at least one new idea. And it's just this thing where you get to sit and you're marinating in your thoughts. Right. And you get to work things out. Um, you know, like, I mean, mental health, right. Such a big topic of conversation today, especially with athletes, but you know, it, it should be with everyone. Um, 
I think a lot of that is because people don't know how to be bored. Right. Number one, uh, boredom. I mean, think about when we were kids, man. If we, I was, if I told my mom I was bored, she would say, well, uh, did you run out of books? Right. Why don't you, how come, why are you bored? Why can't you come up with something that makes you not bored? So I, I think having the, the opportunity to like sift through your thoughts a little bit uh, without the distraction of your phone, without pulling up a game or, all right, let me, I, I can read these two articles, you know, um, or whatever. I can watch this video on YouTube. None of that's available. So it's nice. I don't have to force myself to not, to not take it in. I can, it's just not an option. So it's good. Um, again, marinating in your own thoughts, thinking through ideas, brainstorming with yourself a little bit, which just people I just think don't spend enough time alone with their own thoughts. And so I try to make sure I get plenty of that. And I know, like, I can feel when I haven't gotten enough time. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, mean, yeah. I, I just got done with this book, uh, Digital Min Minimalism. And, you know, it talks about that, right? About how, you know, phones these days, although they're, you know, one of the most powerful tools you could possibly have, it's also a leash, right? Yeah. And so, you know, my challenge to everybody on listening is, you know, be mindful about whether or not you spend any time alone. Because many of, at least the most successful people that I know, would tell you, similar to what you said, the best ideas and the clearest thoughts they have are when they've spent a decent amount of time by themselves with their thoughts, yeah. right? And it, it's just what it is, right? Many of the greatest people in history made the most important, you know, history changing decisions by taking time to really just think. And, you know, people just don't do that enough anymore. Yeah. And, and and the thing is, like, I love socialization. Like, I I love hanging out with people. Um, I like my when we go out to dinner, um, we like to sit at the bar, just because we like to socialize. We like to meet new people. Um, all of that stuff is very important to me. But if I don't get that time alone, where I get to literally just be lost in my own thoughts, everything starts to fall apart. That's that's when I start to feel anxious about the job. I start to overthink you know, man, wow, I'm putting in like 80 hours a week. Can I keep doing this? How do I make the show, you know, this good again next week? All of these things that are just, I mean, I guess it's natural. I just don't feel them when I get that time by myself. Love it. Now, last question as it relates to this, is this something you will do, you know, once a week? <laughs> is it daily? How does it, you know, how does this the manifest? Alone time? Yeah. Like, do you, do you try to build in alone time every day? Is it once a week? What does that, what does that look like? Well, I mean, I do get alone time every day because I work from home. Right. So, you know, I, I, I do get that time. Um, I, I like, I, when I eat, I, I try to not eat at my desk. Like I, you know, I'll go in the kitchen, actually eat lunch and, you know, try to develop better habits uh, around stuff like that. Uh, but once a week, for sure, I get out by myself or, or with the dog mm -hmm. um, who doesn't care if I talk to him because you know, he's not. Because <laughs> that's normal, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, it's totally normal that you're just talking to me right now. Um, he doesn't say much. Uh, but yeah, I, I try to make sure, you know, it, it's, it's all about, again, developing good habits, whether that's showing up every day to work or showing up every day for myself in the, in the form of a little bit of quiet time that, you know, is just for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that if I can do it once a week, I, I don't, I don't fall victim to the snowball effect, you know, sure. Where, where it's like all of a sudden now I'll get this mountain of stuff that I didn't take care of. And now I need it, you know, a week of quiet <laughs> or 10 days. Right. Um, uh, you know, and th this is the other thing is like when that happens, the the positives don't outweigh the negatives for a few days. So when I've when I've gone too too hard too long and didn't make time for myself, it's it's not like I could just go out for an afternoon and it's fine. It's sort of like banking sleep. You know, you can bank sleep, but you have to be completely caught up before you start to feel the benefits. Yep. I look at it that way. So it's like stress management. You've you've got to you've got to catch up. And eliminate all that stress before you can start to get the benefits 
of of the alone space and the and the time with your own thoughts. No question. Yeah, no it sounds question. like a mindfulness ad. Yeah, you know what? Though? <laughs> very very wise advice from the great Dave Dufour. Uh, the decent. We'll say decent. I don't know about great. Get, you know, save the great for Larry Coon. Okay, I will. Yeah. I will. I will. <laughs> Uh, a few final questions. I know you're you've you've got some podcasts to do, some research to do. What's what's one piece of advice you received in your career that you'd want to pass along to the next wave of talent? Don't tweet every thought. Very wise. Number that's probably the best one. Don't tweet every thought. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of uh, I, we didn't grow up with social media, so I think we treat it a little bit differently than than people that are like in their early 20s um then a lot of the people that are going to be you know coming through sports business classroom in the next few years and i think that that's probably the best advice i could give people who who want to do this it's like you know be mindful of that mm-hmm. um like i've developed a per- very particular brand of for being honest um so i can get away with a little bit more but i'm also older so i have a little bit more leeway um, people just kind of, you know, they're like, oh yeah, this is Dave stick. It's, it's fine. Um, but I still don't tweet every thought <laughs> smart at all. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta be careful about that stuff. What do you think? We get half of the thoughts tweeted or what, what, what oh, percentage man. would you assign to, <laughs> uh, let's say a third, let's say a third. Well, the, the other thing is if I throw everything out on social media for free, you don't have to listen to the podcast. Right. So like social media, I, I actually use Twitter mostly to make jokes. Um, it's a way to like help build my character out, you know, my public persona character. It's like, here's kind of what you can expect. I might make a Star Wars reference on the podcast. You know, I I'm going to make this. I'm going to make jokes. I'm going to you know do this. And then that way you don't get the entire show just for free on Twitter. Uh, ever had a major screw up or failure? And if so, what did you learn from it? In this job? In any job. Oh, in any job. Oh, man. Uh, I mean, I screw up all the time. Uh, I once uh, I once got three technicals as a coach in a game. Didn't even know that was possible. Right. Yeah. Um, and and I I basically just learned uh, that you can get three technicals. Don't, don't, so don't do watch that. It. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, because or, I got they, the or you can push you can push it that far, right? Yes. So I got the second one, and I was like, okay, well, I'm out now, so I can just let me just, you know, <laughs> let, me, let me fire at fire at this ref, and uh, ooh, yeah, nope, got another technical, uh, which which caused me to be suspended for a game, which is wild as a high school basketball coach. Um, so yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, that that's one. You can get three technicals. That that's my. I, I carry that with me every single day. That was. I love it. <laughs> it was. It was an insane situation. It was. It was nuts. What were you so mad about that gave you? Or for um, which you got so, the third technical? You know, well, my team was already bad. I had one good player, and and uh, this this kid like had 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 four really bad foul calls against him. Um. And and they fouled him out in a tie game with two minutes left. They called it over the back, and it was the wrong ref who called it. It was the guy out at half court who called the over the back foul. So it wasn't his call to make. Yeah. And I was I was heated. And not because like I don't care about winning and losing, but don't rob, you know, my my kids, my players of the opportunity to win the game, especially on something like that. And so I was mad about it and I got it. I got my first technical and I actually told him, you're going to have to give me the second one too. <laughs> and he gave it, he gave it to me and then I let him have it. And he gave me the third one when I was on the way out the door and I was like, wow. Yeah. There you go. And then I, then I FaceTimed one of my players and I coached from FaceTime. So wait, what you, Oh, you coached via FaceTime via FaceTime. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was, that was uh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Dave, I, I, I'm going to let you go because I know you have a lot to do, but th- this has been awesome, man. I mean, yeah, yeah this you is know, fun, man. this is this is a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, you and I have known each other for about four years now. Yeah, have yeah. never had the chance to really dive into this stuff like we have. And honestly, it's it's probably my favorite thing about the podcast. It's just it's, it's amazing what you get to do when you actually get to interview somebody. Right. 
Like you yeah. get to know somebody on such a, a, a different level. So appreciate the yeah. time, my man. Yeah, it's it's also just cool when you have like minded people that get a space to have conversations, right? Sure. No and question. and you know, it, we all know like that the world is like there's enough conflict. So it's nice when people mostly see eye to eye on stuff and get to talk. So it's, it's, it's good, rare. It's rare, but it's nice, right? Yeah, exactly. So Dave, where can people find you? Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, the handle is Dave Dufour NBA. Put the NBA on there so people know, you know, I'm yeah. not the Dave Dufour that is in Indiana doing something. I don't know what this guy does, but you didn't want to go that, with the real Dave Dufour, huh? No, no. So that I thought about that once as a joke. Um, but then, oh, here's a funny, here's a funny social media story. The, the other Dave Dufour that has the handle Dave Dufour, um, somehow lost it. Like he got hacked and lost it. And I just randomly checked because I would do that from time to time to see if I could get it. And it was available and I grabbed it. And this guy sent me an email and called himself in the email, the real Dave Dufour. Wow. I wanted to print that thing out and frame it. Right. Amazing. Amazing. You should have. That is something that I would print out and put on my wall. It's so great. And and I gave it, I gave him the handle back. And even though he was rude, I gave him the handle back. It's because you're a good man. Yeah, I try. I try. Ladies and gentlemen, the real Dave Dufour. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Uh, let's do this again sometime soon. Yeah, for sure. And next time I'm in LA, I'd like to do it live in the studio. Appreciate your time, Dave. Talk soon. Yeah, man. My pleasure. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Dave Dufour. You can find the show notes for everything we discussed at sportsbusinessclassroom.com forward slash Dave dash Dufour. Guys, I want to thank you for your incredible support. I cannot thank you enough for all of your efforts in helping spread the word about the show. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with your friends, your family, and anyone you think might be able to get something out of it. And if you can, please take a few minutes to review the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you have any follow-up questions for Dave or myself, you can leave a comment on the site or send us your questions on social media by tagging us at Sports Business Classroom, or at Dave Dufour, NBA. Big thank you to our sponsors, Sports Business Classroom Online and Hall Pass Media, and thanks again for listening. We will see you here next week on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience.